<clears throat> Hello there and welcome. Uh, my name is Linda and this is my channel Linda T70. It's really good to have your company today. Um, thank you if you're a returning viewer and if you are new, welcome and I hope you stick with my videos. It's a bit of a different one today. Um, I did ask my regular viewers, I suppose my, a couple of weeks ago, whether you'd be interested in hearing the story of um, my sister. And I've sort of mentioned her in videos on and off, but not in any great detail. And um, she had a life which was kind of blighted, really. And um, I was I was started thinking about her again recently with that poor um, lad that fell off the balcony, the pop singer, Liam, um, Liam Payne. Um, who had had, uh, in his short life, he'd, um, and it seems it's a, something everyone knows about, um, sort of fell into alcoholism and drug addiction. And um, obviously things didn't end well with him. And I just started to think about her and I just wondered if you'd like to hear my story. And um, a lot of you said you would, so that's what I'm going to talk about today. So if this is not your sort of thing, um, I mean, she, my sister was an, an alcoholic. She wasn't, as far as I'm aware, a drug addict. She was a smoker and an alcoholic and they were her things. Of course, the smoking was kind of more controlled, whereas the drink was not. And um, I don't really know where to start or where to finish with this story. It's, I mean, she, without having a spoiler, she, she is now dead. She died um, in 2002. Um, she didn't actually die from alcohol, but, you know, it certainly didn't do her, it didn't enhance her life in the slightest. It was no fun for her at all. And there's a couple of little interesting um, things that happened to her on the way, not in really a very good way, but you know, if it's for you, please stick with me. Um, if it's not, please don't. I don't quite know what I'm going to say, where I'm going to start, where I'm going to finish, but anyway, um, I'm going to just crack on with this because me rattling on doesn't really help, does it? So, my sister, um, to, to start with where I, you know, it's easy to sort of um, be the amateur psychologist with these things but if you as a you know somebody who's lived you know quite a long life now thankfully um, and you look back over things you'd think you didn't think about when you were young or, or in the moment because you just weren't aware of things like people's mental health conditions and um, physical health conditions and so on and I've mentioned before that my um, my mother's first child was um, a stillborn baby um, she had him at the end of 1947 from what I can gather because there's very little information about this she did talk about him a lot through her life but I didn't think to ask her about you know particular detail um, from so he, uh, from what I can gather he was a full-term baby so there was immense sadness and tragedy around that and she was told at the hospital that she shouldn't try and have a baby for at least another year well my mother wasn't the sort of person who decides has that sort of decision made for her she decided that she wanted to have another baby so she consequently got pregnant with my sister and um, my mum had had um, quite a lot of spells in hospital as a child with various um, illnesses. I don't know what a lot of them were, but one of them, I know she had double pneumonia and pleurisy and was in hospital. And she told me at one point she was in hospital for months. So I'm not really sure whether that was that illness or something else. So she was, um, her, her levels of fitness, well, they, they weren't bad, but you know, there, there were obviously problems, underlying problems. And, um, so she um, she decided that she was going to have this baby and she had my sister in early 1948. So there's very little time to, to, to get over my brother. Um, and when she had my sister, um, when she gave birth to my sister, at that same time, she was suffering from a condition. Now, I've written this down because um, it's called St. Vitus Dance. And it's but it's got a, a um, you know a proper name which is rheumatic chorea. 
and I did check this for, for my, you know, uh, for your information and, and for mine really. And it's an, an illness which results from um, a childhood infection. So looking back, maybe that was something to do with something she'd been in hospital with. Maybe it was something to do with the, the, the chest problems. But the, the um, overall thing with St Vitus Dance is you get lots of body ticks and movements which you can't control. Generally your feet and your hands and your face. So there was my mother with a new baby with this condition and I know that she wasn't able to look after. I think she was able to feed her because, you know, a bottle wasn't involved. So somehow she managed to feed her, but my dad took over most of the, the caring um, as much as he could, you know. Um, and I think from probably that time, there was a, a kind of a, a little bit of a barrier between them because we, we like to bond with our children, don't we? We cuddle them and we, you know, we hug them, we, we, we hold them to our, you know, breast to feed them. Um, or, or even if you don't, you know, we, there is a bonding process. And I, I, looking back now, that probably didn't happen. And my, my mother and my sister had a, a not particularly great relationship. I mean, they, 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 it's, they didn't not speak to each other or anything but my, my sister kind of looked down her nose a bit at my mother and it was kind of upsetting really but all through her life my parents both of them supported my sister they didn't ever um, judge her they um, you know when she would drink if they could help any you know in any way which of course they couldn't really because there wasn't it wasn't the um, the sort of well, it's bad enough now to get help isn't it with any addiction um, but, uh, you know, there, there wouldn't have been the facilities available then. So the, uh, I'm just check, I've kind of written a couple of things down so I, I don't get the order wrong. Um, so uh, then in, uh, I suppose about 90, well, sis, my sister was born in 1948, so I reckon it must have been about 1952. And again, I've mentioned this before, my parents emigrated to Australia with her. So she was taken away from, you know, the, we, they had lived in London. My sister was born in London and um, went to Brisbane. And there she I presumably started to have a life. At, you know, she went to school and made some friends, I'm guessing. And then I came along. Um, so having a sibling. Now, she was almost six when I was born. So quite a um, change in your life. Um, I'm, you know, I'm telling you all this in case it, I don't know if it's got any bearing on, on her later life, but anyway, everything comes from somewhere, doesn't it? But I came along and, um, I was, you know, if things were different with my parents, then my mother was well and, you know, I was apparently no trouble and, you know, but then we came back from Australia when I was three, so we're about 1956 now, and so my sister was uprooted again. And of course, my parents were, and I was, but I was a baby, so I did, I was a toddler, so I didn't care. Um, but obviously, it was my my parents' choice to come back to the UK. And um, so then it was another series of her starting schools. Us, we when we came back, we had to live with um, aunties and uncles because we didn't have anywhere to live until my mother found a job where there was some accommodation. So we lived there, and then we moved again to another part of London where. Um, because my father got a job um, south of the river. So we, we lived there for a while. And then we moved again um, and came in to get, went to live in Hertfordshire um, because, uh, again, it was through, through jobs. So even me being um, roughly six years younger than my sister, even I had been more to more schools than a lot of my you know contemporaries have. Um, and my sister had been to even more. So, you know, my, my parents were, were quite sort of transient, really. Um, she, my mum used to say she had itchy feet. And even when we moved to Hertfordshire, we moved house several times within the town we lived in. So, you know, it was, um, she, she never quite got over that. I think dad would have stayed, but mum, mum had different ideas. Um, so... My sister and I didn't get on as children because she had to babysit for me and I was quite a lot younger and I can imagine I was a real little snitchy snotty thing. And um, 
then when she got to about um she 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 was at school but she used to play obviously she went to school but she used to play truant a lot she didn't enjoy uh, learning uh, um not at school anyway um and um but she she used, she did have friends she had some nice friends at school then she went to college and learned to be a, a shorthand typist which is what a lot of girls did in those days um and um during that time she was she was ready to leave home really when she when she'd finished college she didn't really enjoy being at home with us um i didn't really have a connection with her because she was i was you know 10 or 11 or something and she was 16 17 and um you know that we we had nothing in common at all and she was always you know in a bad temper and um you know had no no sort of kindness for me but then looking back I don't, I don't really blame her. Um, this did change, though. As adults, we were much, much, much closer um, because I always say you're, um, when you're children and you've got a big age gap, that is a massive age gap. But when you're adults and you've got the same age gap, it narrows somehow, doesn't it? It doesn't really matter whether you're, if you're, 26 and your sister's 32 you know you've got more in common than you do when you're much younger so um anyway so uh she started to we'd moved in that house again for, for another job but as i say it was in the same town and i'd gone to secondary school and by then she was getting itchy feet and wanted to leave home and she was a child of the sixties and she left home um you know at the swinging sixties um, and she left home to, uh, to to do a flat share and she went to Belsize Park in London, which was, I don't know if it still is, but it was quite a trendy area at the time. And um, I remember thinking, oh, my sister's got a flat in London. And I didn't really, but but she would come back home in between times when either the, you know, the, the, the flat share didn't work out or whatever. I don't know, because no one really told me anything at the time. And uh, so we did spend a bit of time together. And during that, those few years, she had boyfriends. She had, um, she was very, I think, quite beautiful. Um, she had this amazing long blonde hair. Um, I, sh I should show you a picture of her. I will in a second. Um, and she got, she, even at 17, I've got, still got a photo of her up on upstairs. Um, a photographer noticed her somewhere and took all these black and white shots of it well black and white shots when she was 17 most film was black and white um and uh, she just looked like a model to me i just thought she was amazing to look at and um she got engaged and um then the, that didn't work out her boyfriend slept with her best friend and all this sort of malarkey so it was kind of a series of um you know letdowns and sadness and i suppose in um insecurities and all these sorts of things actually i'll show you that i've got a page here not that it's you know if you're interested in a, a picture this book which i got when i was 70 my kids made for me or my daughter made for me she got a little page for my sister in here um although my the the, the daughter that is my is the current husband's daughter so she never knew my sister but she did a nice little um little page for her when we were little i mean <clears throat> so <laughs> so obviously we're all very young then so that i was a year old here and um yeah well <laughs> and this is all these are all i think oh no these these top ones are in australia so mum and the two of us on the beach, um, that's, we went on some holiday to Cornwall. Somebody forced us to put her arm around me. Yeah, that's, uh, so sister, she's written that on there. Um, I'll try and find a more up-to-date picture of her while I'm going through. Um, anyway, so she was engaged, as I say, and that didn't work out, and... I used to sit and watch her get dressed when she was back at home, going out on a Saturday night, because they'd always go to pubs, her and her friends, and, you know, the whole gang of them. And she'd sit there and um, meticulously do her eye makeup. She had really lovely hazel eyes. And um, 
she'd have a, a block of I, I, I probably a lot of you will know because you know if you're my age or older mascara used to be in a block and you'd have a little brush and she would spit into the I know it's lovely isn't it spit into it and put this on and she'd layer up and she her eye her um, eyelashes and have like winged um, uh, eyeliner and I used to be absolutely spellbound I used to try and do it when you know when I started to wear makeup but it never quite worked on me um anyway and about this time I didn't know anything about her drinking and um but about around this time she told me late in later years this was this was the time she started to drink and she started to drink for Dutch courage before she went out um <clears throat> She, I mean, she was, she, but you know, she was actually um, a woman who was funny, um, clever, really, really clever. Because she didn't wasn't interested in school, you'd imagine that she was a bit thick, <laughs> but she wasn't. She used to speak. We, you know, me and my parents spoke the same way as though we came from, you know, the the town we came from. But she just spoke as though she was extremely well educated, and she the the um. She was a bit of a wordsmith. She, she, her, her use of language was really brilliant, um, and you kind of look at her and think, well, how can she be like that? Because we're not like it. Um, but anyway, so time went on, and the next few years, and she found she had another boyfriend, and she moved in with the with him into a flat in uh, in Wilsdon in London and they used to have parties and enjoy themselves and, and by then I was about 20 or something and um, <clears throat> this is when she first told me that she had a drink problem or had had a drink problem I'd never really seen anything of it but after that you know things did kind of gain a bit, bit of pace and I suppose if you're aware of stuff I've seen her at parties smash her hand through a plate glass window um and you know not not have a scratch on her i you know she's been screaming and shouting um just awful behavior really and you just the thing is you just don't know what to do to help it's completely you know these are the days before Al Al-Anon and everything i don't even know if she ever went to alcoholics anonymous but over the years um she did seek some treatment but I'm trying to think of the next thing to tell you that's um so the, the the other thing to sort of illustrate this was the day i got married to my first husband um she was my bridesmaid and uh, she didn't really want to be my bridesmaid because she wasn't interested in um despite ha having been engaged to someone she wasn't interested in being married to anyone she was happy to live with someone but she didn't want to be tied down in that way and she was never interested in having children children were just the, you know no 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 thank you and uh, she liked little animals though she liked things like hamsters and gerbils and rabbits and anything kind of cute um but yeah the day i was getting married she she reluctantly agreed to be my bridesmaid my, one of my bridesmaids and um she was sitting at our, our house, you know, my mum and dad's house. She didn't, I, I can't remember where she, oh, she must have lived in Wilsdon at that time. Um, anyway, and um, she said to me that she needed a drink. And so on my wedding day, um, she didn't drive then, and I did. She asked me to go into our local, well, we called it a village where I lived, but it wasn't, it was a town, Um to buy her a bottle of scotch so I did I drove on my way the morning I I was in the middle of doing my getting my hair and everything well I was doing my hair I didn't no one was doing it for me because basically you kind of didn't really much then um you did it all yourself and um so I drove had to drive into town and buy her a bottle of scotch so she could have enough courage to be my bridesmaid which is just so incredibly sad and do you know it's not that I forced her to do that she she wanted to well she didn't it wouldn't have been the top of her thing a list of things to do being someone's bridesmaid but she did love me and um I suppose she wanted to do that for me so basically although she wasn't falling over and you know doing awful things during on, on the day of my wedding she was 
drunk. Um, there were t periods of time in our lives where I didn't speak to her very much. I used to write letters to her actually because of course we're talking of days when there weren't any mobile phones and she was usually living in a flat somewhere and there was usually a phone in the hallway, you know, like a, um, a pay phone or something. And so it was sometimes difficult bit potluck if you could get hold of someone really and I know she lost a lot of time off of work holding down jobs I know this is from later years her telling me she'd have a drink before she got out of bed in the morning but there were times in her life where she was sober and she couldn't ever really work out what it was I mean I'm sure there were occasions where she something had happened for example, like a boyfriend sleeping with a girlfriend or some your your friend or something. I don't know, but um, where that might turn you to if you if you're inclined to drink um, to to block things out, which is what of course it, it is, and giving you a bit of a self of a sense of self um, loving maybe. Um, you know, it, it, there there were occasions when she would have done, but she she did say to me in more recent years I don't know what it is just sometimes I just have to have a drink um going forward a few more years I mean there, there were as I say she she lost time from her jobs I think she I, I mean she used to drink vodka because people that drink think that if you drink vodka no one notices and I suppose that's up to a point that's true but if you've got your suspicions, I think it's quite easy to tell if somebody's, you know, been on the source um, when they probably shouldn't have been. So she probably didn't hide it terribly well. But anyway, um, as I say, go forward a few more years and I can't even remember what it was that was the instigator. But when my daughter was about... Um, because that was another thing about not liking children. She absolutely adored my children. Um, my daughter was her, um, well, my children were obviously her only nieces and nephews because we were the, the only two siblings. And um, I've got some lovely pictures of her visiting us when my, my daughter was a small baby, just a few couple of months old and she's hugging her so much and that was the thing that me and my sister never did we did I we have never had never hugged each other um my parents thought they were quite demonstrative well my mum been you know all through her life she said oh you know you, you you were so loved and I used to love hugging you and in her brain perhaps she I know she did I know she loved me and she loved my sister I'm not doubting that for a minute but they weren't the sort of parents that would hug you um they might think they were but they were not like we do now we're much more demonstrative and there's nothing wrong with my parents they were kind people um they were just parents of that that time we weren't really hugged were we um you know I don't think I was anything unusual and um your, then your parents want you to hug them but then you, it, it's not a natural thing is it because they it's just some families do I mean we're we're quite a demonstrative family now um you know like my generation and we all hug each other and and everything but my parents as I say of that generation they didn't um I forgot when I was going with this one hang a second yeah, that was it, the hugging thing. We never hugged. And we used to joke about it in the end. We just used to... I mean, we, we did love each other. And we knew that we loved each other. And we were very close. We got very close. Um, but we... Even the day she she died, I, I she was um, just asleep in, in the bed the last time I saw her. And I really wanted to hug her, but I thought, I can't. Because if she, what if she thinks, if she knows what I'm doing and she thinks, well, what's she doing that for? We don't normally do it. We just make a joke out of it. So I just gave her a little kiss on the, on the head. I didn't realise that'd be the last time I saw her. But anyway, um, I'm jumping ahead there. Um, yeah, so we didn't, we didn't do that. But anyway, so the years went by and she, yeah, she got really bad at one point and she was staying with us. We had a we only had one child at the time, and we had a tiny um, 
a little third bedroom and she was sleeping in there and she just spent all her time in there she didn't we knew she was drinking and every now and again she only stayed for about a week or something um, she'd bring down a massive bag of empty vodka bottles. I don't know where she got it from. She must have sneaked out. I mean, it, it wasn't that she was trying. We were saying, don't drink while you're here. We just didn't really know what to do. And what's the point in saying to someone that drinks, don't drink? Because it's not, not going to do it, is it? Um, I was a little bit worried with, with her around my daughter, who was then about, probably about three or something. can't really remember, three, four maybe. But she was always lovely to, to my daughter and my both my children were very, very, very fond of her all, th all through her life. So that was that was good. There was no nastiness or anything with with them. Um, but she decided one day she said, I'm going to go. Honestly, Lynn, I'm going to go into rehab. I can't stand this anymore. You've got, got to help me. So me and my previous husband, who was a, a real diamond with all this as well. I mean, you know, you, you marry one person, then you get a load of <laughs> hassle from their sister in their life. I mean, it's, you, you don't always sign up for that, do you? But he was very good about all this. So we managed to, we took her to, to see our doctor and they got her um, admitted to a rehab clinic. And I don't know if it's still the case, but the one she went to at the time... Um, it was also a, like a, a home, a, um, I don't know how you, what you say now to, to make it sound right, but uh, may, mainly mentally ill people were in there. I suppose now all those places have gone because everyone's caring in the community, aren't they? But before this was before all that and there were all sorts of people with an awful lot of very odd behaviours in this place and she went into this particular bit that was for alcoholics and we used to visit her and my god i don't know how she stayed there because there was some quite um really awful behavior from the other people that were around but she stuck at it um and as a result of um that she then moved to another another unit but anyway she got she got dry and um, I can remember visiting her and telling her that I was pregnant and I was expecting my son and um, she was really thrilled about that anyway she got her act together and I think she went for eight years before she drank again but as part of this story, now there, there is quite a, I don't know what time I started this video, so you can always fast forward to the end if you want. But um, she, when she finished at that particular unit, sorry, my, my head's racing with all this stuff. Um, she went to a, like a house afterwards where a lot of people who had been um, in, in uh, drying out um, would go to this sort of communal house before they moved on to find somewhere else to live and while she was there she met this guy who um he had had a prior drink problem but he'd been dry for a long time he wasn't staying there he visited somebody there i believe and he had he had been a fireman and he was actually one of the firemen that was at the king's cross fire but he'd been um what's the word you know when you can't do the job anymore retired retired out of the um fire brigade because he'd he'd sustained a back injury during that job but he um <clears throat> excuse me but he um had another career which i know a lot of firemen it was the thing then anyway that that they did um he was a financial advisor anyway they got together and that was all good, that we all saw that as a positive because he was such, I have never, you know these people that are, um, people say they're, a char they're charming. Now this guy wasn't attractive, physically attractive, but she saw something in him because he was 100% charming. We got to know him, he had a, an, uh, a nice house in um, Surrey. Um, he had a, um, he was starting a business. Um, he'd obviously 
been made, I presume he'd had some sort of payoff from the fire brigade, I don't really know. But he was, um, you know, he's, he seemed to know his stuff about um, financial advice. He apparently he owned several other houses um, which he was renting out. He did speak to um, me and my first husband um, at some point and was asking us about um, putting some money into something. And um, we just didn't really have the money anyway. Um, we trusted everything that he said to us, but we, we said, no, we, we can't. We're not in a situation where we can do that. And then they decided to get married. And to me, this was the most amazing thing because I thought, she's finally you know settled down someone you know she's she's dry um you know he's doing well this is going to be a really nice life um so they decided to get married <coughs> excuse me and um so the day of the wedding came and we were at the house my parents my me and my previous husband and my two children at their house before we went to the registry office and there was um somebody phoned up and said um something about a test drive for a volvo car and they'd already left for the registry office so my my then husband answered the phone he said well no he's off to his wedding reception um he's not doing and then, anyway these people at the test drive place weren't very pleased because he'd booked this strangely it was his wedding day but who knew and then they got married and that was all fine and then at the reception all these blokes came in when we were all sitting down eating it was about four or five blokes came in and apparently this guy her her now husband had booked a wedding reception in a fire brigade related premises i don't I can't remember any more detail about that the so he he um hadn't paid them but he'd they'd got all the food everything was prepared and he was supposed to pay them after the you know when he arrived for the for the reception so all the reception food the cake and everything was laid out and we were in a totally different venue in a pub in epsom in surrey and these Firemen, firemen were not happy as i say a lot of um firemen had different or you know diff, did up different jobs as well as the fire brigade thing um i presume because they had lots of time i don't know um but th that was my understanding anyway at the time so these people did catering so these were people he knew from his fire brigade years he you asked them to do his wedding reception and they then he'd not turned up and they were demanding their money and it all got a bit nasty and my uh, my previous husband um him and um my my sister's husband kind of calmed these people down with promises of yeah i mean you know obviously my ex-husband didn't know anything about any of this um calmed them down and they went away and they said they wanted their money and i know for a fact that quite soon after they they went on a honeymoon somewhere and then quite soon after they got back there were bang there was banging on the door and there were these people were after their money and my poor sister had to face them at the front door all on her own i don't know where he was um anyway so that kind of went i don't know what i presume they were paid because otherwise they my my brother-in-law wouldn't have had any kneecaps by the sounds of the way that was all going um and then so they were they were married probably a year and he bought her husband bought a house in um ross on y so miles away from kingston they lived in the kingston area and his business had already started his financial services business and my sister because she knew you know she was a typist and everything she did do some work for them and her first name her name was leslie and his name was James, Jim. So the company he called Leslie James Associates. I should have told you her name really, shouldn't I? Perhaps I did, I can't remember. And um, at some point she was kind of put down in this house in ross on Wye and left there without him. I don't know the ins and outs of it. Um, 
I don't think there wasn't, as far as I'm aware, any mistreatment. Um, but he was obviously having a life where she wasn't involved and had no visibility. She didn't drive. Um, and it, there was one, we didn't know this at the time, but there was an occasion when the police turned up at this house in ross on wise a great big house in its own grounds. It was really nice. Um, and our, they were after him and she couldn't, she said, well, I, you know, he's in, um, he's in Kingston, um, at his offices. And they said, no, we've, we've been there. He's not there. And uh, they were, they arrested her and took her to the police station to try and get information out of her. Now, apparently what he'd done over, a, I mean, this was a quite a short period from when they'd married. He had been embezzling all the money that he'd got from people that who had, um, used his financial services basically everything he was um telling us as our family was a load of, of lies another thing i mentioned meant to mention was my my parents were living um in devon at the time and they um, had a council house and he he bought the council house he said he'd pay for the council house had a mortgage on it so that they didn't have to worry well, as soon as this all happened, of course, you know, he was nowhere to be seen. Um, he did, he was Irish um, from Southern Ireland and he basically, he'd buggered off, sorry, he'd, he'd gone to Southern Ireland and because there was no, um, you know, thing where you could get people back from Southern Ireland to, the, to, to England, uh, well, I don't know if there is now, but there wasn't at the time, no, there's nothing anyone could do. So she'd been arrested. People were who had lost their money were after his and her blood because her name was on the company name and she'd been, you know, she was his wife. So they all thought that she knew what was going on. Um, these houses, I don't know whether the houses he was supposed to have owned, I think that he really did, but, you know, I, I, they, I, I don't know, it was all quite nefarious around that, so I'm not really sure. But um, so there was no money. He'd been lying to everyone. He'd been charming everybody. Um, and the bloke was just a nutcase. Um, he actually, his father was a police, a senior police officer in Southern Ireland. So, you know, who, who would have thought? And he'd also been married before and got two sort of young teenage children that used to come and stay with them. So there was nothing to say that, um, there was anything shifty going on. Anyway, my sister was absolutely devastated and heartbroken and he contacted her at one point by phone, I think. And he said that he was really sorry for everything, but he wanted to be with her. So if she was to, um, she, she'd been released from custody by then. Um, if she'd like to, to be with him and come to Ireland, you know, he was going to be staying there. So they arranged, she thought, well, yeah, I, I love this man. So they arranged a date and time um, and he was going to meet her. And, well, you can guess, he just didn't show up and she never, ever saw him again. Um, I mean, just dreadful. Um, I did try and find it, actually. She um, wrote a, a letter because he was... Um, What's that thing called? You know, local businessman. Um, he were, I can't think what it is. I've tried to find the, there was a newspaper, right? I've got a newspaper where my sister wrote an article because everybody thought that she was involved and she wanted to have sort of her right of reply. And a trade of com Chamber of Commerce, is, it, is that it? Um, and it was the headline in this paper had been leading light in the Chamber of Commerce or whatever, you know, has, uh, uh, stealing um, from his uh, clients, something to that effect in the Kingston Comet or something this was. And um, and lots of people after after her blood as well. So she wrote a, ni a nice long article to the, which they published, to be fair with her right of, uh, to reply and just said, you know, telling her side of it, telling her she didn't know anything about what had gone on 
Um, she wasn't involved. She was as much a victim as they were. She was stuck down in a house, you know, a hundred and whatever miles away from where he was. And she didn't have any, apart from typing out a few letters, she had no dealings with the company at all. So, yeah, that was, uh, that was a very sad situation. And of course that would, um, inspire a bit of drinking like a lot of things did. Um, but then kind of towards the end of her story I'm so sorry if this has gone on forever I don't know if I can see how long it is but anyway um the, towards the end of her story um I actually haven't checked it's recorded all right I hope it is because I'd love to say all this again um she did meet somebody else at a singles club when she was in her I don't know in her 40s and they set up home together and um, she would have sporadic bouts of drinking, as I say again, sometimes she didn't know why. Well, most of the time she didn't know why, but just something would grab her. Um, and the last um, thing with, with that relationship was um, she'd had a particularly bad... And I, I understand that, you know, it's not difficult. It's, it's very difficult dealing with somebody that's in this frame of mind. What do you do? You know, if they're shouting and screaming and throwing things and all the horrible things that she probably did. Um, and um, he, eventually he just said, I've had enough. And he threw her out. She had a nighty on. He threw a coat out after her and said, I've had enough. And he locked the door and he wouldn't let her in again. So she managed to get to a neighbour's house and rang me and said... I don't know what to do. I've been drinking and he's thrown me out. He's, I, th I think he'd actually hit her. I don't, I'm not saying he did that as a, a, a regular thing. I don't think so. But I suppose frustration. I don't know. Anyway, so I lived with just with my son um, then. And um, so my son would have been about 16 or something, I suppose. My daughter a little bit older than that. Um, and my daughter didn't live with me. She'd moved away. Um, and um, I went and picked her up. She By then she lived in South Woodford, so sort of East London way. And I drove from um, my house that I lived in at the time to and picked her up. And she looked just like a down and out on the street. And she got me to stop at an off licence on the way home. And she bought a bottle of vodka. And we went back to my house and... She said, oh, I've missed out quite a big thing in her story, but I, I, I won't worry about that at the moment. Um, uh, she said to me, oh, when we got to my house, I said, do you want a glass to drink that? Because I, I knew I couldn't sort of stop her drinking and I knew eventually things would pass. And she said, no, if I, when I'm drinking, I have to drink out of the bottle because it makes me feel even more disgusting than I feel and it makes me think I need to stop doing this. And then this was in December and um, she said to me, she had, um, she, she had tried to take her own life a few years before. This was the bit I missed out. Um, but um, she, she'd take, basically had a lot of tablets on a platform station in the middle of Wales. She was working in Wales at the time. She'd taken a job working in a in a country pub. And of course, that's the worst thing. And she'd been found stealing the alcohol. So they sacked her immediately, which is fair, fair enough. And she went to the, the, the train station, which I gather wasn't like Euston or anything. It was quite a quiet place. Um, she took a load of pills and that was going to be the end for her. But somebody found her and took her to hospital and she recovered from that. And that, that was a few years before and then she'd met this guy. And then, um, so when he when she was staying with me that time and she was drinking vodka out of the bottle, I mean, it's just, just so, so awful. Because you do wonder, don't you? You've got two daughters from the same parents and one goes this way and one goes the, the the other way but then you think well I suppose it's all the stuff I described at the beginning um but she said to me look Lynn she said I can't really stand this anymore um um what was her husband called uh, not her husband her previous boyfriend what was he called 
can't even think. Wasn't it awful? I can't think what his name was. He's, he's dead now anyway. But um, she said, uh, Stan, that was his name, Stan. She said, Stan, you know, Stan doesn't want me. Um, I, I'm just going to, he said, I, she said, I'm not going to do it here. I'm going to be somewhere else, but I'm, I'm just going to, she wanted to take her life again. And I said, well, you can't, you can't, you can't leave me on my own because our parents had both um, died by then. Um, and I know that people who want to do that, take their own lives, aren't rational and they think everyone will be better. <coughs> Uh, everyone would be better off without them. Sorry, but but that's just not true, is it? You never you're never better off without someone. Sorry. Sorry. Um, yeah, you're, you're, of course you you that isn't the the other people's view at all. I I see that she would think that, but I I didn't think that, and I didn't want her to to leave me on my own. And, um, but the next night, as I say, she was still staying with me. Um, the guy that she lived with phoned her and said he wanted to get back with her and he was going to come and collect her if she wanted to be with him. And she did. So, um, she left. Now, she'd also, in this sort of time span, she'd had what she was diagnosed as, um, having irritable bowel syndrome, um, she had lots of trouble with that. They'd been on a cruise, the two of them, sometime previous, her and this, this guy she lived with, Stan. And um, uh, she said it was hell because she just couldn't do anything because she kept having to rush to the loo and everything. I'm sure, I mean, lots of people suffer with that, I know. Um, and hopefully you get it diagnosed and you um, you get it treated. But she, she didn't really have any treatment at all. Sorry about this. And... Um, so she went back to to his house with him and she sort of was sobering up sobered up by then and she decided and they decided they were going to get married he'd proposed to her so he said you know and she was thrilled about that which surprised me really but there we are and um i thought well whatever makes her happy and um she went to the doctors again about this irritable bowel syndrome thing and to cut a very long story short she was then diagnosed with having uh, bowel cancer it wasn't irritable bowel syndrome at all now we're talking about 20 2001 maybe something like that um so we're talking about a good few years ago now and treatment for these things is far better now and people's awareness is far better than it in, than it was in those days um so you know not not, not trying to, to frighten anyone um but she just didn't have a clue and she was she went by what what the doctor said she didn't sort of persevere with it and they said that she had a, a year to live and um ironically though in that last year I said why don't you have a drink if you want she said no, I just don't fancy it then I just don't fancy it the irony eh um so she had a um she was offered a course of the um chemotherapy and they said if you have the chemotherapy you're not going to get better but you'll have a better quality of life for your remaining time which we expect to be around a year um but if you don't have the chemotherapy you'll probably have I, th I forget now half that time or something like that so she opted for the chemo and um she used to ring me when she was having her treatments because um you know the treatments take place in east london and i lived in in um you know in hertfordshire it wasn't sort of around the corner or anything and anyway she didn't you know i did used to go and visit her and see her and and um yeah, I mean, she, she, she was great. I really, she was funny and everything. Um, but um, she used to ring me up and say, oh, I've just been chatting to a girl here. She's got, she's only 25 and she's got cancer and she's got young kids. And my sister would be there sort of on her fag, having a fag outside in the, the hospital. Um, and she said, it's so sad. She said, I haven't really got anyone 
you know, dependent on me. Um, and she used to feel so sad for these other women that were, um, well, women and men, that were, were suffering and they, they had little kids and, and everything. Um, so, yes, yeah, so she, 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 she had about a year and she, she died in, um, I, I do say died and dead, by the way. I know a lot of people say passed over, passed, passed away, passed on. I, I can't bring myself to, to use that because I just, you're not really, well, in my view, that they, that's the term I use. Um, so anyway, she, she, she died, um, in the beginning of December 2002 and um, her, her bloke phoned me when I was at work and said I don't think she's gonna she's been or she was taken into a hospice and um, I, he said I don't think she's going to be around for much longer he'd been had to, to be fair to him he'd been sort of helping her at home we we were hoping to go and see her We'd, we were having a slightly early Christmas um, but he rang up on that day and he said she's just not well enough and a few days later he rang me to say she's gone into this hospice and um, so I went and we sat and chatted while my sister wasn't she wasn't awake and he left um, after a while and he left me with her for a few minutes so I just said my my goodbyes gave her that little kiss on the head and um, yeah that 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 was it so it's it's sad but um yeah, I think she she certainly left her mark though on me and my you know a lot of my friends from years ago know her and knew her and um, she's fondly remembered and it's such a shame she had this this bad you know bad set of cards were dealt for her I suppose and it was so difficult i mean you know, people now though have got addiction problems i don't know anything about drug addiction i did ask her once if she was ever addicted have i already said this addicted to drugs and she assured me that she hadn't been but i don't i'd never seen any of the you know the stuff that goes without i mean i'm sure she might have had the old bit of wacky backy most people have tried that haven't they not me i have to say but you know lots of people try that and um but uh, i don't think she, anything stronger than that um but uh yeah the it, it's it's just i don't know it's just so sad for someone that was so fantastic i mean the, the thing with her was she she could be so funny at times we still talk about me and my kids because current husband's never met her you know she was gone before i met him um and what you know silly things happened to her you know she was quite posh she liked to to see herself as being a little bit posh and she was stuck on a train once when it went into the railway sidings you know you sort of you hear these stories but it actually happened to her once and she's shouting for help and no one heard her eventually somebody did and got her out but you can just imagine it can't you and uh, there was a famous occasion with um these these aren't hilarious stories or anything, but me and my um, my ex husband and my, our two children and her went for a meal at some restaurant that had opened up, and uh, she looked down her nose at the menu a bit because it was basically sort of pasta dishes and whatever, and she was a bit fussy about what she ate, and um, she said to, <laughs> to this waitress, she said, um, "I'd like <laughs> I'd like the lasagna, please," and the waitress said with chips <laughs> and she she said lasagna with chips i mean she sounded like who is it miss lady rochester is it out of um the importance of being earnest a handbag you know with this exact intonation and this poor waitress if the ground could have opened up she could have only been about 16 or something um and, uh, you know, she just had this sort of attitude in life and she went in the post office and somebody, she was queuing up in the post office and somebody took exception to something she was asking. And she said, do you know who I am? And I mean, it's just this sort of attitude. She, you know, there's lots of little things where she just brought joy into to our lives. And um, it, it's a shame that she's not, she's not here anymore. And I'm sad about that. But... People, as I always say, people are never really that far away, are they? They are in, I see her in 
people I'm related to. I can see her in my daughter sometimes. I'm not, <laughs> not in the, the alcoholic way, but the actual personality. And um, oh, there's a nice picture of me and her. Oops. Sorry, the others are, most of these are of me. Oh, it's not all about me, is it? But um, hold on, let's move this a bit closer. So that's her and that's me. I think I was 21 then. I hope you can see that all right. See that lovely hair? Oh, there's me as well with the brown hair. That was about a week before I got married to the first husband. Um, my sister and my mum. Sorry about the reflection. Oh, there's me just before I had my, my daughter. Yeah, so I like this one because this is my mum, uh, my sister, me and my dad. And that's, um, that was in 1979. Yeah, so she was lovely and I hope you found this interesting and sorry about the bit of a blab I did. Didn't expect to do that um, because, uh, you know, she had a good, she had a life. Um, I will just um, sign off with one thing though. Um, we had a school reunion because we went to the same secondary school but I wasn't there at the same time so she'd already left. And it was this, so Holmes Hill School in Boreham Wood 40th anniversary and the school was closing down and they asked so we got this sort of leaf um, booklet thing which I got on the day and um, you know what I was saying a bit earlier about her um, sort of having a bit of a transient I'm using that word because I think it, she uses it in this this bit of writing she had a very good way with words and there was a little they asked that like the the pupils, past pupils, if they had any comments to, about the school to um, write and they put them in this magazine. And um, she wrote, I am sorry to learn that Holmes Hill will be closing. Oddly, after all these years, what I seem to most value about my time at the school is that during, during a transient childhood, Holmes Hill gave me five years of stability it was actually quite a wrench to leave. When I started at the school, the headmaster was Mr Heaton. I think he would be pleased to know that during his years as head, he inspired in me the utter terror. However, he inspired something more, an obligation to feel pride in the school and a belief that Holmes Hill pupils were in no way inferior to the grammar school a few yards along the road. As a result, I have never felt secondary modern to be a derisory term. Leslie Wilcox, pupil, 1959 to 1964. On that note, I will leave it. I hope this has turned out all right. I hope um, you like it and I will see you with something a bit more cheery next week. So you take care. Goodbye.